Welcome to the final lesson on our series titled, I Believe, A Study of the Apostles' Creed. In this lesson, we'll look at those concluding statements. In the lesson on Jesus, one of the different lessons on Jesus, I made mention that while there are many statements made about Jesus, more about him than any other individual uh, item or person, uh, there were still many different things that were not included that are included maybe in some other creeds. But in those statements about Jesus, it was trying to emphasize uh, his, the, the, the full humanity and the full divinity of Christ. <clears throat> When I think about these concluding statements, they're so familiar to us. Sometimes I think we don't pause and take a step back and ask the question, well, why were uh, other statements not included? Uh, for example, there is no statement in the Apostles' Creed about the authority of Scripture. Now, clearly it assumes the authority of Scripture because it goes and lays out those different beliefs that we have from Scripture. But there's no specific statement about the Bible. There's no specific statement about the great commandment to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. There's no uh, statement about the great commission to go and make disciples. No statement about the, re about the return of Christ in the sense of the coming of the full kingdom of God upon this earth. The only statement really about the church says we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. We'll look at that in just a minute. But there's no full statement about the purpose of the church or why we have it and those sorts of things. And I bring up these specific items because in other creeds, these items are included to different, uh, in, in different uh, measures in different degrees. Uh, now, of course, one of the things is that the Apostles' Creed is the oldest of these historic creeds, and the other creeds could look at that and say, wait, I, I wonder why this wasn't included, and they have an opportunity to include it. Also, there might have been other conflicts at different times in history that came up, and those creeds were addressing some particular issues that at the time of the formulation and then the kind of reformulation and the, the codifying of what we know now and have in its current form as the Apostles' Creed, those things just weren't needed or seen as needed at the time. Um, but when we look at those, those closing affirmations, we can see uh, some of those, again, important doctrines of the faith that really tie into each other. You will, we'll see how most of those tie into each other even if they're just kind of one individual line. But also, of course, they reflect back to the nature of God and the nature of Jesus that we see in other parts of the Apostles' Creed. Well, the first of these statements simply says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, it's my view, and I think probably of, of, of most people I've talked to, uh, pastors who deal with these things, that this statement is the most misunderstood statement in all of the Apostles' Creed. In the time in which it was written, this statement would have been a given because there was no other dominant church at that time. Certainly there were other small groups that were around and, and who held some different beliefs, but really back in that day and time, you had the Catholic Church. It wasn't even called, excuse me, it wasn't even called at that time the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church because that didn't happen until after the Great Schism, what's called the Great Schism in 1054, when there was a major split between roughly the Western European Christianity and the Eastern European Christianity, and you had the first major split in Christendom uh, for what became called the Roman Catholic Church, in the more prevalent in the West, and the Orthodox Church, more prevalent in uh, the East. So in that day, this day and time, when the Apostles' Creed is formulated, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the word Catholic would have been with a big C, a formal title and name. Of course, on this side, 500 years removed from the Reformation, uh, and now in a, in a world where Christianity is worldwide, where there are literally tens of thousands of different denominations and thousands of denominations even in our own country, we hear and read that a little bit different. So when we say that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the C is a little C, it's a non-capitalized C, and it's utilizing the meaning, the literal meaning of that word, the word Catholic just simply means uh, universal in the, in the midst of that. 
Now, I have had some folks over the years, different folks over the years, who would tell me, they say, when it comes to the Apostles' Creed, I just don't say that statement. And they say, I don't say that statement because I'm not Catholic. Well, they're partly right. It is true that in our United Methodist tradition, from which I come from and which I teach, uh, when we are not Catholic, we are not part of the Roman Catholic Church. But it is true that we are part of the universal church, that regardless of that denomination, we are bound together in that mystical way as part of the body of Christ, with Christ as the head of the church. We are bound together uh, in, uh, by our faith in Jesus Christ, and that faith transcends any particular denomination, uh, no matter how big or how small, how well-known or how uh, how obscure or, it, or hidden it might be, um, that we are all part, as bound by our faith and our proclamation of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we are part of God's universal church. And ultimately, when the time comes, that that is what is most important. We do have our different denominations, we have our different ways that we express our faith, and we have different emphases that we have in the midst of this. And yet we are all bound by that common proclamation that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord, that salvation comes through him, that we have that uh, everlasting life. So we can say, regardless of our denomination, we can say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church because we are part of the universal church um, established by uh, Jesus Christ. The next statement talks about the communion of saints. Again, maybe this, this might be the second most misunderstood statement in the Apostles' Creed uh, outside of the Holy Catholic Church. Because sometimes I also have people say, well, I don't believe in all those saints. And they know that in the Roman Catholic Church and others, there are different feast days or different saint days that are there. And, and there is in the Roman Catholic Church a formalized process by which a holy person on this earth can be beatified, what's called beatified, and go through the process of being declared eventually a, a saint. Um, but really, this in, in our context of understanding, in the overall context of understanding, the phrase, the communion of saints, simply affirms that we are bound together in a way that goes beyond our understanding, that those who have gone before us and those of us who and, and have, have left this earthly realm and now reside in heaven with God, and those of us who are on this side of of eternal life and in this earthly realm that we are bound together in a way that goes beyond our understanding that we uh, join together in that full communion and that the the church of god transcends time and space and we'll look at that a little bit more when we talk about uh, the phrase everlasting life now, one of the things that we say is, so people have said to me over the years, well, I don't really believe in all those saints. I don't believe in that. And some people don't say the communion of saints either. But really, when we talk about uh, one of the common phrases that I've heard people say is, well, uh, we're so glad. They're, they're, they're now you reunited with their loved ones, you know, or, or I'm so glad that mama now is, is up there free of pain and, and smiling down on us, watching what is going on with us. When we make for sentences like that, when we say things like that, really what we're affirming is that we believe in that life that continues and that there, there is some sort of connection, even if we don't understand exactly how that works, that there's this connection that binds us together even, uh, even though we might be separated uh, temporarily uh, by, by death. Um, there is a, a, a wonderful story that I ran across uh, years ago uh, about a young man who was a third string quarterback on his local high school team. It was his senior year, and he had not started the entire year, had barely played, only if it was a blowout, they were winning or losing by a huge amount. Uh, and then he was usually only just, just a few snaps. Uh, the team was out of the playoffs, and they had nothing to, 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 to play for in that sense. So the coach decided that as a gift to this young man who had been a senior, who had he knew he wasn't going to start, but he showed up every day, he worked hard, just didn't have much talent, uh, he decided that he would start this young man on his last day, last game of his high school career. 
And much to everybody's surprise, the kid had the best game that anybody had seen. The coach had never seen him throw that well. He'd never seen him uh, throw that hard and hit those pinpoint uh, passes and, and all those different things. And he was just stunned. And he asked him after the game, he says, what's going on? I've never seen anything like that out of you. And the young man looks at him. He says, well, coach, you know that my dad died a few weeks ago. And he says, yeah, I'm aware of that. He says, and you know that he was blind. He said, now that he is dead and up in heaven and looking down on me, I knew that this was the one time that he would actually be able to truly see me play, and I didn't want to let him down. Well, I don't know if that's how it actually works, but I find comfort in that. And I do think that whether that's exactly how it works, I do think that what that story gets at is that that heart and that understanding that we are bound together in an eternal fashion by God's love, past, present, and even then into the future because God is above time and space. God is the creator of time and space. So he is above that and, and is not bound by those things. And God in his uh, beautiful love for us um, binds us together in ways that go beyond our understanding. And so when we celebrate communion, we believe we are communing with God, but we believe we're also communing with, with those saints. We believe that we are communing together as that, as that mystical body of Christ um, manifest in the church that we see here on uh, this earth. The communion of saints is certainly much deeper than that sentiment of, of that beautiful story. But I do think it gets at that idea that there is something that's a relationship. The relationship changes, but it doesn't end. And, and it's also a reminder that we are all part of the kingdom of God uh, as those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. A lot of people still tend to shy away from the idea of the communion of saints, but I think we're, in doing that, we're affirming the witness and the example of those who have gone uh, before us, and I find that to be a very comforting, and to know that, uh, and to hold on to that, uh, that idea and that belief that one day, when my time on this earth has come to end, I'll be reunited with those loved ones, excuse me, who have gone before me. The next phrase says, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. The scriptures affirm over and over and over again the belief and the affirmation of the forgiveness of sins. Now, that forgiveness of sins is two things. First and foremost, that forgiveness of sins is that we have been forgiven of our sins by Jesus Christ. But it also means that we then are called to forgive others. Christ proclaimed forgiveness of us and of the whole world through his sacrifice on the cross. Christ, God offers us that, that forgiveness and mercy. It's a gift of his love. He has forgiven us through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And we then have to, but we have to accept that forgiveness. And then as forgiven and reconciled people, we are then called to offer forgiveness to others. Um, and I think one of the reasons they included this in here is, is a couple of different reasons. One is that in talking about that forgiveness of sins, it's talking about what Christ accomplished on the cross and how it is that we can um, uh, be part of the church, how it is that we can enjoy that communion of saints, how it is that we can have that uh, everlasting uh, life in, in him. And, but I think it's important because that, that the church affirmed the forgiveness of sins. Of all the different things, again, that they could have affirmed, they affirmed the forgiveness of sins. We know, don't we, that forgiveness is difficult. When somebody harms us, we don't always respond that well uh, because we are hurt, and too often we act out of that hurt. But forgiveness is powerful because just, just a simple definition of forgiveness, forgiveness is letting go uh, and, and not retaliating, and it's no longer holding uh, an offense can perpetrated against you against somebody else. It's not holding on to that grudge against somebody else. It's letting those things go. You don't hold that offense against them uh, anymore. And we do know how difficult that is because our initial human nature reaction is to lash out when we are hurt. 
whereas the forgiveness of sins involving, in, involves choosing not to respond in that manner, choosing to respond as Christ responds, choosing to uh, let that go and not hold on to that hurt uh, in the process. C.S. Lewis kind of gets at the, at the difficulty of forgiveness when he says everybody thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And I think we have seen that many times. I know I've at least seen it in my own life. It's one thing for me to ask you to forgive me because I know I didn't mean it. Even if I had done something that was hurtful, I know I didn't mean it. And so I go, well, would you forgive me? It's, it's a much different thing, or it shouldn't be, but it often is a much different thing than for me to forgive you because you hurt me. And so that forgiveness is important because it involves um, asking for that or it involves letting go of something that we have been uh, holding on to. Forgiveness is so important because without forgiveness, there's no possibility for a true and lasting relationship. Because it's a certainty, it's a certainty in life that no matter how much you love somebody, no matter how close you are to them, no, how, no matter how sincere your, your belief or desire, you're going to let somebody down. You're going to let. There's nobody that you're ever going to interact with in this life that at some point you're not going to let them down. And in those truly important, at least in terms of those truly important and lasting relationships, in relationships that really matter, they're going to let you down. And you're going to let them down too. It's just part of the relationship. It's part of our human existence where we just sometimes mess things up. And, and even inadvertently, we know that there are times where we cause harm. So if we're going to be in relationship with one another, and, and if we're going to be in relationship with God because Christ talks about the necessity of forgiveness, then we have to be willing to let go of that hurt and not hold a grudge against someone who has caused harm. Now let me say a quick word about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness does not mean that we just totally forget it. And depending on the type of harm and depending on uh, the, the, who that person is and where they are and the situation that you find yourself in in relation to them, um, and especially if that relationship is broken, it does not mean that, um, that the relationship may be reestablished. And it may be difficult to reestablish that, especially if the other person refuses to even acknowledge any harm done. So it doesn't mean necessarily that even if there's forgiveness, that there's going to be a restoration of the relationship. It takes, as, as the old saying goes, it only takes one person to forgive. I don't need your response in order for me to forgive you. You don't need my response in order for you to forgive me. But in order for us to have a relationship, it does take both of us. In order for there to be true reconciliation and a restoration of that relationship, it takes both people, whereas forgiveness just takes one. But regardless of how the other person reacts, you see, forgiveness is independent of that. We are called to forgive because Christ forgave us. And really, the only reason that we can make this affirmation of faith in all of its deep meaning is because we affirm the forgiveness of sins in that Christ forgave us. And we affirm the forgiveness of sins in that we are called to forgive others. And we forgive others and Christ forgave us not because of something that we had done even before. Christ on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. The only reason that we can affirm forgiveness of sin is because, as Paul reminds us in Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We affirm forgiveness of sins not because we are fine, upstanding people who deserve the mercy and grace of God, but because God is gracious and loving and merciful in spite of us. Ultimately, that statement that says we believe in the forgiveness of sins tells us that we understand that we are forgiven people, that God in Christ has forgiven us. And in that extreme mercy that Christ has shown to us, we are then called to forgive others. We are called to forgive the, the minor debts of others, even if they seem so major. We're called to forgive the debts of others in response to the unpayable debt that God has uh, forgiven us of. 
It goes back to that parable of the unforgiving servant when he's forgiven 10,000 uh, uh, 10, talents. And 10,000 talents is 150,000 years of debt. It, 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 it was a number that in, in that day and time, as they understood how much that was, it was a number so ridiculous as to uh, people for to understand that it was hyperbole. It'd be as if somebody, it'd be of me saying, I owe you $2 billion. I mean, there's just no way that that could actually happen. So it's such a crazy number that that's, it's meant to mean something that's just outside or seemingly outside the realm of possibility. Yet in Christ, Christ has forgiven us that magnitude of sin. And then in the parable of that same for service servant that's been forgiven 150,000 years of, of debt well, is not willing to forgive 100 days. Of debt. See, that's the comparison God is making. If you think that, that something is too great that somebody has done for you to forgive, then what you're forgetting is that God has repaid, has forgiven you that unpayable debt. One of my favorite sayings about forgiveness is that, that our failure to forgive somebody is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. The person we are ultimately harming when we fail to forgive is ourselves. Because that lack of forgiveness, that bitterness, that hate, that anger, uh, that holding of a grudge that stays in us, ultimately it corrodes our own soul much more than it does the other person. It moves us farther away from God. We can proclaim the forgiveness of sins because, and, and when we are here. And we can proclaim because uh, uh, because of what Christ has done for us. We can proclaim our belief in the forgiveness of sins because we know that we have been forgiven. We can proclaim our belief in the forgiveness of sins because we are then called to go and forgive others of their sins. The next statement goes and says, I believe in the resurrection of the body. This is another one that causes some confusion. And, and basically what it states is it affirms what Paul talks about. And I'll read that passage from 1 Corinthians 15 in a minute. He says, but, but just as Christ has a, had a bodily resurrection, we too will have a bodily resurrection. As Christ was raised from the dead, the time will come where we too will be raised from the dead. Now, there are a lot of different questions, and people point to different scriptures. People of good faith and, and, and a good scholarship point to different scriptures to try to make their case about when and how uh, this resurrection of the body looks like. And it's not essentials of the Christian faith, uh, and, and so good Christians can read these things and come away with different opinions but it, because it's not just entirely clear. Here are some, more of the, some of the more common questions that I have gotten over the years. When a person goes to heaven, do they have that physical body? When we talk about the earthly body being here uh, laying in the grave, is it only the spirit that goes or, is, or when somebody goes to heaven, is there a new physical body that they do? And if they have that, is it just a, a manifestation of the physical body that they had here when they died? Is it a totally new, different body? If it's new and it's different, do, do we look like we did here on this earth? And, and if not, then how do others know uh, how will people in heaven recognize us if we have a different uh, body if we look different than we do here in terms of that resurrected form people have asked over the years and I'm writing this from uh, living in the south uh, in the first uh, ask about cremation or ask about autopsies in the early years of my ministry, I, I did very few funerals where the person was cremated. Now, a lot of the funerals that I do um, are folks who chose to be cremated. There was a real, um, real nervousness and, and, and really just almost taboo nature um, for many, many um, decades and maybe even centuries about being cremated because the idea was, well, that if you were cremated and all you were were ashes, then on that day of resurrection, on that day when the body is resurrected, how, will, um, how can God do that if it's only ashes? Now, my quick response to that is that if God can reanimate dead, dry bones, um, and no matter how long somebody's been there, uh, then God, then ashes certainly shouldn't have, shouldn't be a, a problem uh, for us. Uh, and, and that goes into the next question. Is the body that's resurrected, is it resurrected immediately, or do we lay in the grave until Christ returns? 
And again, there are different scriptures that people can, can point to to talk about that, about how the dead in Christ will be raised and those different things that will happen. Uh, and uh, my short answer to all three of these questions is uh, we don't really know. And there will be people who will say, well, we know exactly what it means because scripture says this. But then others can point to other scriptures. Um, years ago, I did, when I was at the Ellison and Pickens charge in the late 90s, uh, Ellison United Methodist Church and Pickens United Methodist Church. I had uh, a series one time or a sermon uh, one time that was called Write Your Own Sermon Sunday. I invited people to ask different questions. One, one person in the congregation said, why do you and other preachers talk about somebody residing in heaven with God when we know that we all lie into the gra in the grave until that day of resurrection and then we will be reunited with God? And my response and my answer is for, for that part, for that question was that there are scriptures that seem to indicate that. But then again, we also have the thief on the cross where Jesus says to truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, some have tried to make the explanation and says what Christ was saying was truly, I tell you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. But that's not what the Greek says. The Greek says, truly, I tell you, comma, Today you will be with me in paradise. And then Jesus gives us a parable about the rich man and Lazarus and how Lazarus is immediately taken into the bosom of Abraham. And even though that's obviously not a literal thing, um, he uses that as an example of uh, the parable seems to indicate uh, that Jesus is talking about somebody who immediately goes. So do we lie in the grave and it just seems like the snap of a finger for us? It seems instantaneous, but, but those who died in the, the formulation of the Apostles' Creed in the 300s, they're still lying there in the grave. Or do, do we have this resurrection whereby our spirits go up to heaven and one day there will be a full bodily resurrection upon uh, this earth and we will all come back and, and, and have these bodies Christ, where Paul talks about the perishable must put on imperishability, um, or do we go immediately into that union with, with, with God? Um, I'm comfortable as I stand in sermons, in, in funeral sermons, and talk about that loved one being in the presence of God. I think the communion of saints affirms this and hits at this part, that when we die, that, that we go to heaven, and we are in that uh, union with God from that time on. And we are in that union with God forever. Uh, but we don't know, no, the truth of the matter is that none of us knows exactly how this is going to happen. The scriptures don't lay it out in a very clear process, even as some tell you that they do. There are, multi, there are different scriptures, multiple scriptures that seem to, in, to indicate uh, different things or at least open to different types of interpretation. So we may not be, uh, the, the particulars may not be real clear, but what we do affirm is that we will have a resurrected body. We, the scriptures affirm that Jesus was resurrected and the scriptures affirm that we will be resurrected, that we will have a physical body as well. Jesus, when he was resurrected, we know that he ate fish. He told Thomas, put your hands in my side, see the marks on my, uh, uh, see the marks on, on my hands and, and my feet. We know that in that story from John 21, when Jesus was there on the beach and they didn't recognize him at first, and Peter and the others are out in the boat fishing, that we know that Jesus sat on the beach and ate fish and he ate in their uh, presence. And yet we know that, that this is the same uh, bodily Christ who appeared through a locked door on the Easter evening, who kept Mary from recognizing him on that first Easter morning, at least for a moment, who kept himself hidden, kept his identity hidden from uh, Cleopas and the other disciple on that Easter afternoon on his way, on their way to uh, Emmaus. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what that is. I will share one intriguing thought that I heard back uh, in 1997 when I went to Israel. Um, our tour guide there was an Arab Christian uh, and, and he said that their belief was that all people 
uh, that, that when the resurrection came or that that resurrected body, that, that our resurrected body would be what we were when we were 33 years ago, thir- 33 years old, or if somebody, if you, know, if you had an infant or a young adult who died before they got to the age of 33, they would have the body they would have as if they, you know, if they had made it to 33 because 33 is the age Jesus was when he died. I don't know if that's true. There's, there's certainly no proof of that. Um, I like the idea of it. It kind of it kind of fits. But what we do know is that regardless of what happens, we believe in the resurrection of the body. Christ had a bodily resurrection, and we too will have that bodily uh, resurrection. I think the clearest statement that we have about resurrection of the body, as I made mention a moment ago, comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to read verses 12 through 26. So hear what Paul says about this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as being raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ himself has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so will all be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when, the, when he hands the kingdom to God the Father, hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So we don't know exactly how and this resurrection will look like, but we affirm the belief in the resurrection of the body, which leads us then to that last statement of faith and says, and to the life everlasting. Regardless of our understanding of the particulars of these things, what we do know and believe and affirm is that when our faith and trust are in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we have the promise of God that our death on this earth is not the end of our existence. We are promised eternal, everlasting life by God. This statement affirms our belief in God's promise of eternal life in his presence for all who accept the forgiveness that God offers through Jesus Christ, those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The scripture affirms that we will be united with God and that we will experience everlasting life in his promise, in in his presence. Now, two quick things about this. I have had people over the years that go, I'm just not so sure about everlasting life that's a mighty long time and and i just don't know that i want to truly live forever and and in one sense i kind of get that reluctance because uh because that expression is thinking about time in a linear way it's thinking about the passage of time and the way that we think about it here on earth you know we are linear people we tend to think in linear time. We tend to think in terms of epochs and eras and and time and in history. We know that God is moving in history to a certain point. But at least in my understanding of how I think about it, everlasting life is not like we're going to be sitting up there 10,000 years from now and we're going to be going, you know, we've been up here a very long time now. There's no end to sight and this, this singing is getting a little bit old. No, there is no time. Time doesn't exist in the eternal presence of God. Time has no meaning. It's not like we're going to be sitting up there going, oh, well, I thought 10,000 years was long, and now I've been up here a million years and 156,000, 1,156,345 years that I have been up here, you know, in four days, that I've been up here. No, time has no meaning. It's a timeless existence. 
where we are in that perfect unity and that perfect union of God, that perfect unity and union that we strive for on this earth, but that we fall short of. And yet when we die and we go to be with the Lord and we experience that everlasting life, we are in that perfect union with a, a perfect God, an eternal union with an eternal God. But the other thing about everlasting life is not only that time and space have no meaning, the other part about everlasting life is that we don't have to wait until we die to start experiencing everlasting life. Eternal life begins when you accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Because at that point, you then become part of the eternal kingdom of God. We may reside on this earth for a short period of time. But as, but as we are reminded, our citizenship is in heaven. We are bound not by the earthly priorities of this world, but we are to, to emulate and live according to the kingdom values of God. So when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, our eternal life begins in his presence, and we experience his presence, and we experience uh, that union and that relationship then with him, a relationship that continues past the point of death, that continues for all eternity. It goes back in one way to the communion of saints because we're all bound together across time and space into that eternal union. And so while on this side of earth we may have that earthly existence, we know that we will have th that, that this uh, existence continues for all eternity. And I don't know about you, but I find that on this side of eternity, I find that a, a beautiful and, and comfort and, and giving an extreme confidence in knowing that now, that no matter what happens now, I'm already in the eternal and loving arms of God. I'm already safe and secure. Well, there's so much more that could be said about everlasting life and really about any of these and that even in these five lessons, I know that there have been many things that have, have, have been left out. And so if you have any questions or comments, please be sure to share them and ask me and I'll do my best to respond to you. I do hope uh, that you have gained a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation for the Apostles' Creed throughout this story um, and that the next time you affirm the apostles creed and the next time you say those words i believe that you will do it with a deeper understanding a deeper appreciation of of this the historic doctrines of faith and a deeper commitment to god well thank you for joining me throughout this study god bless you and have a wonderful day in the lord